the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Well, we're going to get into the word of the Lord, and why don't you stand to your feet? I'm going to get down on my knees, and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher today. Father, we come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus, and Lord, we're in awe of what you've done this past year. God, we praise you and give you the glory and the honor. All the praise goes to you. God, we just acknowledge your, your grace in our church and in our lives, God, to be able to do what we've done. God, with all those staggering figures of how many people were reached for Jesus, how many people got saved, how many people were encouraged and visited, uh, blessed, Father, that all goes to your credit and to your glory. And Father God, today, as we open up your word, we pray that you would open it up to us. Please give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, that it may produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, give us the guidance and the vision and the wisdom and the direction that we need. Touch us and encourage us, strengthen us and heal us. God, we give you the praise and the glory. Father, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we would ask it on all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. We don't think of ourselves as better than them. But we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, today we praise you and we give you thanks. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Today I want you to grab your Bibles and go with me to the book of Luke. And we're going to be in Luke chapter number two today. And today we're talking about growth for the new year. I thought it was appropriate that on New Year's Day, if we're talking about something, that we should talk about something that's going to encourage our lives for the new year. Each and every one of us don't want to look back on a year and say that nothing happened, that we're the same, that we stayed in the same spot, doing the same old thing that we used to. No, we want to go on with God. We want to advance with God. We want to do more for God. We want to have a a deeper relationship and more knowledge about our Lord. Every year we have an opportunity to start something new. In fact, I was reminded yesterday during prayer that each and every day we have an opportunity to start something new. We've got a blank slate that's been given to us, and we have choices to make as we approach this new year. Now, the question for you and I is, is how do we make the right choices? See, when we go into a new year like this, a lot of times people make a resolve or they say, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. And, and, and throughout the year, the choices come upon us, life comes upon us, things happen, circumstances, uh, adversity and trials and pressures and temptations and different things happen to us throughout the year. And sometimes we make good choices, sometimes we make bad ones. The question is, as we approach this new year and as we approach the word today, how do we make the right, de- the right decisions? How do we make the right choices? Now, the Bible records for us not only the events of Christ's birth, as we saw in the past couple weeks, but also of Jesus' early life, how Mary and Joseph handled the miracle that had taken place in their lives. God had given them something new. In the same way, God has given you and I something new today. We have a new year ahead of us, and now it is our job to steward that thing that God has given us. And so when we look into the life of Jesus in his early life and how Mary and Joseph handled the stewardship of that miracle that had taken place in their life, stewarded that new thing, we can see how we should make the right decisions. Today, I want to take a look at a couple of things of what we can learn from Jesus' early life. We're going to take a look at a couple of things from Luke chapter 2, and we'll make some statements and then read about them in the Word and find out how we can make the right choices as we approach the new year so that we will grow throughout the new year and not stay stagnant, not stay the same, but that we can move forward with God. Today, what we can learn from Jesus' early life. Number one is that we are to get busy with the things of God. We're to get busy with the things of God. A lot of times when people say that they're going to make a resolution for the new year, they're waiting around for something to happen. I know my wife and I, uh, we, we were making that we were going to, you know, fast some things at the beginning of the year. And so we were waiting. And yesterday, as a matter of fact, we picked out on some candy and some things like that that we weren't going to have in the first of the year. But we were waiting for the first of the year. That's not the attitude that God wants us to have when it comes to the things of God. God says, if you know to do good and you don't do it, then to you, it's sin. That means we've got to get busy with the things of God. We shouldn't wait. We shouldn't hesitate. We shouldn't procrastinate. Come on. God wants us to get busy about his business. God wants us to get busy with the things of God. And when we learn something about God and when we know something about God, when we find it in the word of God, God expects us to the level that we understand, to the level of our faith, to operate in that. And so we can see from the early life of Jesus that we are to get busy with the things of God. Let's take a look at it together in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse number 21. 
Take a look at it with me. Luke chapter 2, verse 21. It says, and when eight days were completed. Everybody say completed. completed. Oh, come on, everybody say completed. completed. I thought there was more of you in here today. When eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, a lot of times we read a section of scripture like that, and we kind of have a mental checklist that we check that off the list, and then we move on, and we just read right over it and blow right past what God is trying to speak to us. What is God saying through this? Notice that it says the eight days were completed. See, in, in, in the Jewish culture and, and in the law of Moses that God had given to him, at the eighth day, any male child was to be circumcised. That was a covenant that God had given to Abraham. And now under the law, it was prescribed that on the eighth day, they were to be circumcised. Notice also it says his name was called Jesus. On that eighth day, they were to name the child, the name that that child would be named for the rest of its life. And so we see that Mary and Joseph, on the eighth day, as it was prescribed by the law, had this child circumcised. But also they called his name Jesus, the name that was given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. What is God saying? God is saying that these people were not slack concerning the things of God. That they took care of things when they needed to be taken care of. That on that eighth day they had him circumcised and then they named him according to the name that the angel gave the child. What does that mean? That means that they remembered what God had spoken. They remembered that a miracle had taken place. They remembered the supernatural things that had taken place nine months ago, and now here they are on this day, and they are doing the things of God. They're getting busy with the business of God. Let's read on. Take a look at what it says in the next verse. It says, verse 22, now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed. Notice once again, it says that they were completed. Just like the eight days were completed, now her purification is completed according to the law of Moses. Look at this. They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Speaking of Jesus, they brought Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Verse 23, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. Three times in three verses, it talks about the law of the Lord. It says a pair of turtle doves are two young pigeons. That was the sacrifice that they were to bring. What is God saying? God is saying that the word of God gives us direction in life. Remember, Jesus was born under the law. It wasn't until he went to the cross that he fulfilled and abolished the law in his flesh. So he had to come under the law and live the perfect, spotless, sinless life according to the law. So God selected people, Mary and Joseph, who would steward this miracle in their lives the right way. And they were very careful to observe everything that was written in the law. This is speaking to you and I today that whatever God has assigned for us to do, the things that God has commanded us. Did you know that in the New Testament we have a command? We have a command to love, to love God and to love one another. We have a command to go and to preach the gospel to all nations. We have a command to live holy and pure lives. The Bible outlines how we are to live our life. And therefore, God is saying that if we are to get started and to grow into the new year, let's learn from Jesus' early life. Let's learn from Mary and Joseph that we need to get busy with the things of God. Don't wait any longer. Don't, don't, don't hesitate any longer. Don't procrastinate. Maybe for you, it's this year I'm going to come to church every week. Well, listen, get busy with that. Maybe for you it's, I'm going to start bringing my Bible to church. Get busy with that. Maybe for you it's, I'm going to take some time out to pray and to read a verse or to read a section of scripture. Get busy with that. Maybe this year for you it's, I'm going to pray for my neighbors. I'm going to pray for my family to get saved. I'm going to start inviting people to church. Whatever it is for you, whether it be giving, whether it be volunteering, whether it be coming to church, whatever it's going to take to grow in your life, get busy with the things of God. Get busy with the things of God. Don't wait for tomorrow because before you know it, the year will be gone. I mean, think about it. 2011 was just a blink of an eye. It's already behind us. And now, here we are facing a new year, and though to some it may be daunting, to some it may seem like such a long time, listen, mark my words, you're going to blink, and it'll seem like you just took a moment, and you'll turn around, and the year will be gone. Whatever it is that you know to do with God, get busy doing it. There's a section of Scripture we often read uh, referring to the will of God in James chapter 4. Hold your finger in Luke 2 and uh, let your Bible fall open to Hebrews and then go one book back to the book of James. James chapter number 4. 
we're going to read James 4, 13 through verse 15. And a lot of times we, we, we read these passages in reference to the will of God. But I want to take a look at it with, with maybe a, some different eyes today. I want to take a look at it with a different emphasis and see what God is saying to us about getting busy with the things of God. James chapter 4, verse 13 through 15 says this. It says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Now, let me ask you a question. Hold on for a second. Is there anything wrong with going to such and such a city, buying and selling, making a profit? Anything wrong with that? No, right? Is God opposed to your prosperity? No. Is God opposed to you being blessed? No. Is God opposed to you traveling or, 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 or making plans? No, absolutely not. God's not opposed to you saying, hey, this year I'm going to lay out these things. I'm going to do these things. God is not opposed to that. But let's read on and find out what God is speaking to us. Verse 14, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Listen, we don't have a lot of time here on the earth when we think about it in light of eternity. It's just a twinkle of an eye. It's a little vapor that appears for a second and then it's gone. We don't have that much time. Now, he brings it home in verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. See, what is the priority in this verse? The will of the Lord, right? God is saying it's not sin to make plans and to want to go and buy and sell and make a profit. That's not the problem. The problem is, is that you're putting your things ahead of God's things. And God is saying the proper priority, the proper place is, if the Lord wills, then we shall live and do this or that. See, whatever you do in word or deed, the Bible says do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And just like the boy Jesus, remember, we're talking about the early life of Jesus. You remember Jesus, his parents had taken a trip to Jerusalem, and then they were leaving, and on their way, they had gone a couple days' journey away from Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, Mary looked at Joseph and says, you, you seen Jesus? And Joseph said, I thought he was with you, right? I'm paraphrasing, okay? I thought he was with you. And they start to search around, and the rest of the group, and they say, Jesus with you? He's hanging out with your son. Uh, I, 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 no, not with you. Is he staying with you? Hey, 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 have you seen Jesus? And they realize... He's not there with them. So they start looking around. They go back to Jerusalem. They're frantically looking around. They find him in the temple, right, teaching the teachers. Here's the boy Jesus. And Mary gets over there, and she says, boy, I don't think she, you know, remember, I'm paraphrasing here. What are you doing? We were worried sick. Where have you been? What does he say? Don't you know that I must be about my father's business? See, there was a priority on the things of God, even at an early age in the life of Jesus. You and I, if we're going to make it a great year, if we're going to look at 2012 and have some growth in this new year, we got to get busy with the things of God. Can you say amen? amen? All right. Well, we can learn from Jesus' early life. Number one is get busy with the things of God. Second thing that we can learn from Jesus' early life is that good doesn't mean easy. I'm going to just let that sink in for a minute. Let it marinate a little bit. Good doesn't mean easy. A lot of times when we look at the will of God and we look at the things of God, we say, oh man, everything just fell into place. It was just smooth sailing. Nothing bad happened. It was God. Now, I understand that that does happen, that there are times that are just supernatural, that there's no problems, there's no obstacles, everything falls into place, but that is not the rule. That's the exception. Most of the time, when you read the Bible and in your experience with God, if you're going to get to the will of God, it's going to take hard work. It's going to take diligence. It's going to take pain. There's something we don't like. It's going to take a lot of prayer, a lot of thought, a lot of time, a lot of energy. It's going to take money sometimes. Sometimes it's going to take fighting battles. Sometimes you'll fight others. You'll fight the devil. Sometimes you'll be fighting with yourself. Why? Because good doesn't mean easy. There are a lot of good things that God wants to give to us in our lives, but we have to go through a process of growth in order to get to that thing, and that's not easy. As we look at the new year, remember, we just looked back at last year, and we said it was a tough year, but it was a good year, right? 
So what does that mean? That means that even though it was a good year, it wasn't easy. In order to get to the promises of God, the Bible says that we're all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Amen. Will be. If you're going to live for God, it's going to be tough. And we can't just sit here and think that it's going to be a bed of roses, it's easy street, man, you get saved and you become a Christian and everything's easy from that point on. Oh no, oh no. What did the Apostle Paul and Barnabas say to the believers when they went back through strengthening them? They said, it is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. See, it's a good thing to get to the will of God. It's a good thing to live out your life and end up in heaven, but it's not easy. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort. Let's take a look at it in the early life of Jesus. Here, Mary and Joseph are are in Jerusalem, and they're presenting Jesus in the temple. And there was a man by the name of Simeon. This man was a great man of God, and the Spirit of God had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Messiah. So here he is led by the Spirit into the temple right at the moment that Jesus is there in the temple. And he finds this baby, this child, and he grabs him up in his arms, and he starts to prophesy You can just imagine Mary and Joseph just marveling and wondering at what's going on. And wow, here's the confirmation of the things which were spoken to us by the angel. Here's the confirmation of the blessing that we have. Here's the confirmation of the miracle. This is the will of God. This is good. But then let's take a look at what Simeon goes on to say. There in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse number 34. It says in Luke chapter 2, verse 34, Then Simeon... Bless them. Hey, the blessings of God are good. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Now, wait a second. Wait a second. Doesn't the Bible say he blessed them? You would think he was going to say, Hey, your lives are going to be great. This is going to be easy. This is going to be a blessing to you. You are going to be called favored, and you're going to be wonderful, and everybody's going to love you, and they're all going to bow down at this child. No, what does he say? He says, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Now, we don't like it when things fall. We like to build. We like growth. We like things to go up. We don't like things going down, but in order for certain things to come up, other things have to come down. In order for us to have growth, a lot of times there are things that have to be removed in order for growth to take place. It's just like a plant, right? Jesus uses the illustration of the vine. I am the vine, you are the branches. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he prunes. What does that mean? That means that God will remove. There are certain things that have to fall. Listen, a new year can't even come until the old year is gone. And let's learn from what God is speaking to us in the natural. He's saying that there have to be some things that are difficult in our lives. Sometimes things have to die in order for other things to bring life. Jesus said, unless a seed falls to the ground and does what? Dies, it shall bear no fruit. See, for you and I, we have to realize that good doesn't mean easy. Here he is blessing them. He says, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and a sign which will be spoken against. That means there's persecution coming against it. Let's look at the next verse. Verse number 35, it says, Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. He's speaking to Mary. And he says, A sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Think about the life of Mary. Mary didn't have it easy. She was called a fornicator. She was called an adulteress. She had a tough time in life. There was rejection that took place. How about this? Here here she is at a wedding with her son Jesus. And at the wedding, there's no wine. She goes to Jesus. She says, Jesus, can you do anything? And he says, woman, it's not my time yet. Right? Now, I know a lot of times people say that, oh, Jesus calling her woman was, you know, a term of endearment and that sort of a thing. But but think about it. Here she is trying to encourage her son. Hey, can you do something? Can can we? you're, You're the one. Kid, go for it. You know? And what does he say? It's not my time yet. See, that has to be something in Mary's heart that she had to say, whoa, whoa, what's going on? And then she turns around and she says, whatever he says to you, do it. Let's continue on in the life of Mary. Jesus is teaching. Jesus is going around. People are trying to kill him. He's stirring up a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things going on. Mary says, hey, boys, right? All of Jesus' half-brothers, hey, hey, boys, come on. Come on, we're going to go get Jesus. He's lost it. He's crazy, 
right? They go up and they go and they, 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 they grab one of the people on the side. Can you, can you go get up there and tell Jesus his mother and his brothers are here? And so, oh, okay, hold on one second. They go up to Jesus. They say, Jesus, Jesus, hey, your mom and your brothers are here. And what does Jesus say? Who are my mothers and my brothers? Are they not those who do the will of God? Can you imagine the guy that's going to bring that word back to Mary? He's like, so you want me to tell him you're not going to see him? How about this? Here's Mary. 33 years after this miracle has been brought into her life, standing at the foot of a cross. And now that sword has been plunged into the earth and her son has hung on it, beaten, marred beyond comprehension as a man. The Bible says she's staring into the face of her son and comprehending her Savior. That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. See, good. Jesus was the best thing that could ever happen. Jesus is the best thing that ever happened. But Jesus didn't live an easy life. And now here's Mary with the best thing that ever happened, having a difficult time. Even Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. Life is a good thing, but it's not easy. And there are few who find it. Church, let's realize there are some things we can learn from the early life of Jesus. Number one is that we've got to get busy with the things of God. We've got to get going with the things of God. And number two today is that good does not mean easy. Sometimes, yeah, good things are easy. Sometimes it all falls into place. But when looking forward to this year, there's going to be trials ahead. There's a tough road ahead. We've got things that we've got to get busy with, and it's going to take time. It's going to take effort. It's going to take energy. It's going to take pain. It's going to take prayer. It's going to take some battles, but it's going to be good. Amen? What we can learn from Jesus' early life, last thing for today, is that growth is a process. Growth is a process. Now, we can always be our, our own worst critics. Anybody know that about themselves, that we are our own worst critics? You could ask anybody in this room, what are your good qualities? You might say, well, there's, um, uh, there's, uh, I, I, I'm a hard worker. Um, uh, I'm a, I, did I say hard worker already? <laughs> but then you start to ask somebody, what, what don't you like about you? What are your bad qualities? Oh, ugly, fat, stupid, poor, <laughs> uneducated, uh, right, right? The list goes on. We can be our own worst critics. And as we approach the new year, it, it can almost be a daunting thing, and we can take a look at it. Well, I failed last year. I know I'm going to fail this year. It was tough last year, and I, I didn't quite make it. I don't know how it's going to be in the future. We can be our own worst critics, and yet God is saying that growth is a process. Growth takes time. And wherever you're at, your level of faith, that you are to operate in that area of faith. Don't compare don't try and be someone else. Oh, I, I got saved and now I have to be this spiritual giant that knows everything and can do it all, right? We think that we're able to leap tall buildings with a single bound, stop trains and bullets and all that kind of stuff. And yet God is not expecting us to do those things. God is expecting us right where we're at with our level of knowledge of the things of God and our level of faith to operate in that area and to grow into who we are. What do I mean by that? Well, think about it. Jesus had to grow into who he was. Even though Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the King of glory, he still had to go through a process. Let's take a look at it together. Remember, we're learning this from Jesus' early life. You're there in Luke chapter 2. Turn over to verse number 39 and verse number 40. Verse 39 says, So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. Now look, look at verse 40. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. What's going on here? Jesus didn't come as a full-grown man. There was a process of growth that he had to go through. The child grew Oh, thank God that that's contained in the word for you and I to see. That way there's not the expectation that overnight this has to take place. It was a process of time. 
There were things that had to take place. Jesus had to grow. Jesus had to become something. What? He had to become strong in spirit. He had to grow into that. He had to become that. He had to get filled with wisdom. Why? Because at the first part of his life, he was a vessel that was open that could be filled. Do you know the Bible says that in the book of Hebrews that Jesus learned obedience? That blows my mind. Jesus had to learn something. This is the creator of the heavens and the earth. This is the one who existed before all things. This is Jesus, the star maker, the planet maker, the king of glory, and yet he had to learn something. He had to be filled. He had to grow. Look at this, and the grace of God was upon him. You and I have to realize that growth is a process. We are not going to be overnight who we are. Oh, yeah, in the spirit, when you're born again, you are now a child of God with full rights and privileges in the kingdom of God. You have the authority of God. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. You are blessed with every spiritual blessing. That is who you are. But here on the earth, you are living in a flesh body, and you are growing into and becoming who you are. It's a process of growth. Let's not be so hard on ourselves to where we expect that, hey, I gotta be the spiritual giant. No, you gotta be who you are with the level of knowledge that you have and the level of faith right where you're at. That's what God wants from you and that's what God expects from you. And God wants you to grow into the things of God. It might only take a second to get into a new year, but it takes 365 days to define what that year will be. You have 8,760 hours to make choices that define what that year is going to be like, good, bad, or indifferent. There's 525,600 minutes for you to grow into what God has for you this year. Let's take it day by day, step by step. Every journey starts with one step. This year starts with today. Today you have a choice. Today you have something ahead of you. And let's not expect to be this super spiritual, all that, and the bag of chips, right? No, God is expecting you to learn, to grow. If you're going to build a wall, you start with a foundation and you add brick by brick, layer upon layer. That's why we preach line upon line, precept upon precept in this church. Why? Because God wants you to add to your life day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Learn something new and apply it to your life. Then you learn something new the next week and you apply it to your life. Then you learn something new the next week and you apply it to your life. That's how growth is done. It's slow. It's slow. You don't always see it. It's not always big and bursting and miraculous. No, growth is slow. I remember one time uh, I was on a missions trip and we were going to a training camp before we went out on the mission field. And so they took us and, and we flew into Illinois. And there in Illinois, we drove into the middle of a cornfield where our training camp was. And as we're driving in, we're going down these roads. And, you know, I, I'm a California boy. I, I grew up with the mountains and the ocean. And, and, you know, there's almost not a place you can't look and see something that's just phenomenal. Even you go to the desert, and it's beautiful. And you got these big rocks and big mountains, all this kind of stuff, you know. And, and it's just beautiful here. Go to Illinois. In the middle of Illinois, it's corn for miles. You know, so already I'm feeling a little uneasy. And as we're driving into the training camp, they stop the bus. And the team leader gets off the bus and runs out in the middle of the cornfield. And he runs out in the middle of the cornfield, stops, and turns around, and looks at the bus. Now, all of the people that were going on the missions trip that were headed in this training camp are kind of wondering, what's going on? You know, what's he doing out there in the cornfield? Just standing there. Corn's about this high, you know, about shoulder, shoulder height. And he's just standing there staring back at the bus. And we're thinking, is he, like, fulfilling a dream from his childhood or something? <laughs> what's going on? So a moment later, he runs back and jumps on the bus and sits down, and we, we go back into, the, into our training camp. Doesn't say a word about it. Two weeks go by. We've finished our discipleship training. We're ready. We've got the tools that we need to preach the gospel. We're going to go all over the planet. We're going to preach the gospel. We're going to disciple others. We're going to do all this stuff. And, and, and we're driving out. And as we're driving out, we're driving back through the cornfields, and we stop at the exact same spot in the middle of the exact same cornfield, and the bus driver stops once again. This time, the team leader stands up and gets out, runs back into the cornfield. But this time, when he enters the cornfield, you can't see where he went. He disappears. After a moment, he goes back to the same spot where he was, and he lifts his hand up and starts jumping up and waving at us, and we finally know where he's at. A moment later, he runs and gets back on the bus, and he says these words. He says, growth is often unseen. 
And you don't realize until you look back and see what God has done, how far you've come. In the same way that corn was just here and then in two weeks, without even knowing what was going on, it was over his head. Same way, we look back on a year and we say, wow, look what God has done. Today we're looking forward, and, and you know, it's, it's unseen. We don't know what God has for us. We don't know what the future holds, but listen, there's going to be growth in your life. Don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Don't quit. God has great and mighty things for you ahead. Amen. If you'll turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter number 65. Let's end with this verse, Psalm 65. Great verse that I go back to year after year. Psalm 65, verse number 11. Talking about growth for the new year. Psalm 65, verse number 11 says, You crown the year with your goodness, and your paths drip with abundance. Maybe you don't know what that's saying, but think about a path. A path is a place that's been worn, it's been walked on, it's been trampled down, it's compacted. But the promise of God is that even on those hard Stony pass, even though it's the path of God and it's good, it's not easy. But he says, even in that place, it drips with abundance. God will make it a place of prosperity and blessing, a place that produces something. You crown the year with your goodness and your paths drip with abundance. What did we learn today from the early life of Jesus? Number one is that we gotta get busy with the things of God. We gotta get going. Number two is that good doesn't mean easy. Sometimes it may, but not always. Tough road, but you know what? It's good final thing we learned today is that growth is a process. If you heard from the word of the Lord today, come on, give him a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, you guys have been great today, and I just want to thank you for coming. Thank you for getting involved. Let's not stop here. I want to make sure that before you guys leave, that your heart's right with God, because if you didn't have a right heart with God and you left this place and died, you wouldn't make it. You'd end up in hell instead of heaven. Say, Pastor Dan, what are you talking about? Here's what I'm talking about. Did you know that a lot of people think that they're going to get to heaven just because they've been good? Because they've been nice. Maybe they gave their money to charity, helped people out, did good deeds. They think they're going to get to heaven because they've been good. But nowhere in the Bible to say you can be good enough to get to heaven. Because the standard is perfection. And no one is perfect except for one. His name is Jesus. So you're not going to get to heaven just by being a good person. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. So that means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. And you might be saying, well, Pastor Dan, that's great. You get there your way. I'll get there my way. We'll all end up in the same place. No, we can't do that. Can't do it your way. Can't do it my way. Can't do it some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to do it God's way. And all roads do not lead to heaven any more than all roads lead to the moon. You've got to get there one way. There's a specific way. And don't you think that God, creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who penned the plan of redemption and carried it out in his son Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross, don't you think that if he wanted us so bad to get into heaven that he would go through all that, don't you think he'd tell us how to do just that? Well, he does. He tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the Bible. A lot of people would say, well, that's great news, Pastor, because I know that the Bible says that we're supposed to go to church and we're, we're, we're not only supposed to be good, but we go to church. I was raised in church. Parents took me to church, called me a Christian, hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or christened as a child, took you to religious classes like Sunday school, maybe catechism class or Sabbath school class. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. Not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, denying hell, Right? wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you attend church, call yourself a Christian, be raised in church and your parents tell you you're a Christian, that that makes you a Christian. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, or be born in America, that America is a Christian nation and you get to go to heaven because of those things. It simply does not work like that. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that because you're not some other religion, that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian headed for heaven. So come on, let's think about this. Examine your heart right now. Don't let anything distract you or disturb you. Think about your life with God. Listen, this is the first day of a new year. You've got a great opportunity ahead of you. Consider where you're at with God. What makes you think you're going to get to go to heaven? 
Sometimes people would say, well, not only was I, when I was a child did I go to church, here I am in church today. This was my New Year's resolution, coming to church. It's great, glad that you're here, but show me the Bible where you sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Because it doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Any more than you can sit in the ocean, call yourself a fish, and that makes you a fish. It doesn't work. You can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. You say, but wait, Pastor, at my last church I got involved. I sang in the choir, I helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions. People thought of me as a leader. Taught in the Bible classes and even got a membership card to that church. That's great. Once again, I'm glad you did those things, but show that to me in the Bible where that gets you into heaven. Church involvement. Nowhere in the Bible just say you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. You sing in the choir, teach in the classes, or carry a card to a church that that gets you into heaven. God's not waiting at the gates of heaven looking for a membership card. You might say, ah, ah, got you on this one. Somebody told me that if I know God, I'm a Christian headed for heaven. I know God. Just celebrated Christmas, sang the songs, celebrate the resurrection at Easter every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you. That's great. Once again, glad you can do those things. But show that to me in the Bible. Where having head knowledge about who God is gets you into heaven. Everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about some mental ascent towards God, knowing who he is, and being able to quote some scriptures. But rather, this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. When Jesus came, he was speaking to a religious leader of his day. This guy was a good guy, did good things, raised up in his church called the synagogue. He became a leader and got involved. He could quote the scripture. He could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? He could debate the scripture. Gave money to the poor in his community. Brought his tithe and his offering into the house of God. We would have thought anybody was going to heaven. We would have thought it was this guy, Nicodemus, that Jesus was speaking to. And yet when Jesus comes and speaks to this great man, he doesn't say, hey, Nick, man, you're doing a fantastic job. Just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, Nicodemus, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term, being born again. It's not about what society says. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? Well, it's always meant the same thing. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. This is an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, the third chapter. Jesus is speaking to the church just like he's speaking to this church today. And he says, when I come... I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? What does lukewarm mean? Well, here's what it means, a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not your everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. And I love you enough and respect you enough and honor you enough to tell you the truth and not play games today. How do I know that you're not going to make it? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Listen, you've got a new day ahead of you. You've got a new year ahead of you. Why not start it out right by making the right choice to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life? In a moment, I'm going to do just like this. One, two, three, count to three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together just like this. Three. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang. That's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all of my life. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. I came with people today. People will see me. Uh Uh-huh. You might be embarrassed, but get over it. Why? Because think about, think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Come on, today, will you give them all of your heart? Will you give them all of your life? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see your hand go up. Count it, you can put it right back down. He says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. That's what we want. But he also says, if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. Will you give them all of your heart? And will you give them all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. 
who should raise their hand. If you're not sure about your salvation, come on today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm and you know that's the condition of your heart? You can get right with God in this safe and friendly place on this first day of the year. Make the best decision of your entire life. Come on. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, if you're watching by television in the foyer or if you're watching the live stream, you can raise your hand right where you're at too. I'm going to count to three and pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. Let's do it all together on the count of three. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one, two, three. Thank you. There's four. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Four wise people. There's five. Thank you. God bless you. Help me, ushers. Anybody else real quick? There's five wise people already. Five, six. I got you. Seven up on top. Thank you. Anybody in that family room? Got about seven wise people already. Anybody else real quick? You need to give God all of your heart and you need to give God all of your life. Real quick, got about seven wise people. If I don't see you, wave it at me real quick. Anybody else real quick? Real quick, they're pointing out. I got you, got you. There's seven, eight, thank you, nine. Anybody else real quick? Nine wise, don't you know if there's nine, there's 10? 10, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. You should, come on, go for it. Go for it, I didn't embarrass them and I won't embarrass you. Anybody else, where you at, number 10? Come on, just lift it up when I'm looking your direction. Anybody else? Anybody in these sections here? Anybody up on top? Number 10, where you at? Come on, come on. Oh, got you, number 10. All right, number 11, number 11, where you at? Is there a hand? Okay, everybody's pointing like this. It's... Anybody else real quick, real quick? Anybody else? Well, there's about 10 or 11 wise people. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Hey, all 10 of you, if you're number 11 or number 12, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. I want to encourage you to do something. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're all going to sing. As we do, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. Get a hold of a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today. But we can't do that until we get you down here. So if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, you just get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. You come right now. Let's all stand and welcome them as they come. Hallelujah, they're coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. You just come right now. From the family rooms, if you want to bring your kids, come on, bring them down. They'll remember this. Come on. You can come too. Hallelujah, they're still coming. Let's give them a hand. You just come. Just make your way to the front right now. You come. Anybody else? Come on, make your way to the front. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. All right, all right, everybody. Hey, look up here for a second. Put a smile on your face. This is the best decision of your entire life. This is the way to start out the new year. We're so excited that you guys came today. Now, real quick, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. See this guy right over here waving at you? It's Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. Listen, you already got past the dude that was in the middle of the cornfield, okay? This, it's easy from here on out, okay? He's going to do three things with you. Number one thing he's going to do, he's going to pray a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your life. You're going to be born again, okay? Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff, some free information, and some free literature that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. A little booklet our pastor wrote that will just give you this, some direction for what's next. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to take you in the middle of a cornfield. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'll, I'll, get, off, I'll get off that, okay? Third thing he's going to do, he's going to just introduce you to a friend. We call them spiritual personal trainers. Basically, you heard a physical trainer at the gym helps you get strong, right? Helps you get buff, that sort of a thing. Spiritual personal trainer is a friend in church who will help you to get strong spiritually. Listen, you're not going to grow without somebody coming alongside you and encouraging you to move on and move forward with the things of God, okay? And SPT is that friend in church that will help you to move on with God and not go back and serve the devil. So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Praise God.